I really, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to visit with you, uh, and, and I agree totally with with uh, Dr. Justin in that that we have lots of information on herds of animals. We have lots of information on individual animals, and our um, our practice is a uh, a network of veterinarians that spends most of our time now in, in beef production units, feedlots. So I'm speaking from from my experiences in in uh, feeding operations for cattle, uh, ranch situations, and background in yards. One of the things that I I uh, want to understand, want you to understand, is I want us all to work together to justify more human interaction with our with our food producing animals rather than less. I want us to use the technologies, the data that Dr. Justin's talking about, but there is plenty of room for a lot more people in our industries. And as we think about why we have some people come and work with us and get uh, uh, discouraged and leaving, I want us to think about that together as we go through this whole whole explanation. <clears throat> I, I, the topic today is, is uh, the whisper technology to diagnose BRD in, in uh, cattle that are abnormal. So whisper is a uh, electronic stethoscope system uh, that we developed, and, and uh, it's uh, Merck has that technology now. But I want to, I want you to understand that that is is a really important part of our feedlot practice every day. And I want us to think about together that it's only a part of a tool. So it is an extension of stockmanship and antibiotic stewardship. Uh, I I go I go to veterinary meetings and uh, out in Nebraska and and. Uh, uh, in the in the fall, when we have lots of address changes in our animals, and we have the risk of BRD elevate, a lot of times you'll see a group of veterinarians uh, gathered around a table wanting to discuss the attributes of various antimicrobials. And we used to exchange ideas about the efficacy of antimicrobial A, B, C, and D. And I used to be intrigued by those conversations, and now I'm really intrigued because. I really think that having a discussion about the attributes of an antimicrobial is a waste of time unless we're talking about the exact same level of pathology in the lung of the calf. And that's what I think we've missed a lot in the industry is that we've, we get, to, uh, we have to use pooled datas, a pool, pooled data sets and, and herd summaries are really, really important. But as you think about your experience in, in a protein producing setting, most of these animals are part of a herd, but they are also individuals, just like we are. They become ill one at a time. They get well one at a time, or they go to heaven one at a time. So it's really important that we think about the individuality of animals with, within a herd. The stockmanship component of our practice has been the most exciting experience I've had in the last 20 years. And I, I want to give credit to some geniuses from around the world that have come and helped me uh, understand animals at a higher degree. Bud Williams uh, was the genius of stockmanship. He came from Canada and lived with me for five years. Uh, a, a family from Australia came and taught us how to wean our calves, how to manage our growing baby calves in such a way that they would gain the same kilogram of weight the day where they were separated from their mother that they did pr the day prior to separation. And that has changed our ranch. And so a lot of these things that we talk about, I think we really have to put in focus and never ever take for granted how important education is. Why do young people leave a routine job in a feedlot? Why do these beautiful young genius people just get disenchanted? It's our fault. What I want to talk about the next little bit is how do we eliminate mediocrity through absolutely stopping repetition without reward? And the only way we stop repetition without reward is to support and guide both the animals and the people under our, our care. What Bud taught us to do was to understand these animals at a higher degree. This is, this is just a picture that reminds me of how, how I was, uh, my intuition was backwards. 
This is a herd of cattle that were supposed to move down this fence to a gate to the left. And, and I was setting, we were just setting out here horseback, and Bud said, Dr. Tom, how would you start this herd to move? And he'd been teaching me about gentle angles, and I'd said, well, I'd trot around behind them and put gentle pressure on them until the herd moved. And he said, why would you push on the back of something that has stopped? Work with the front. And that applies to our people in industry. That applies to people in the government. That applies to people that we work with every day. Be available. So I said, well, Bud, how would you move this herd? Well, he said, I'd work with the front. Well, I said, well, that red heifer must be the front. Oh, no. That's a sensitive, neurotic, hard-keeping animal that the intelligent animals have pushed out in front in case there's a wolf over the hill. That's not the front. I said, well, where's the front? Well, he said, if you go and speak with people or you work with animals, usually the most intelligent creatures are in the second row. They're not, they're not out in front. They're in the second row. So I said, well, how are you going to work? If the front is the second row, how do you work with them? Well, he says, Ziggy knows. That, that dog's name was Ziggy. And I said, well, tell Ziggy we want to go left. So he just made a point of looking down at that gate, and this dog came out, and this black heifer was standing out here. He made a point of being on her left side, and he just went by her until she asked him for guidance, and then he just went out, straightened out her head so she, he was available, came by her eye, and when she stepped forward, this dog and that black heifer took all 300 of those cattle down to the gate, and they just stood there. That was new to me. That was new to me, understanding what animals crave, what they crave, their instincts. And so these, these types of things are things that we need to continually learn about and share with each other. Uh, we need to, uh, no matter where we put a, a swine in a swine operation, uh, the, the chickens in the organic egg laying situation, wherever these animals are, we, our responsibility is to convince them to perceive to belong where we intend. And then they can flourish er uh, any place. Those confinement barns in Ontario, Canada, those cattle are so content, so clean, so healthy. We have other places where we give animals a little more room but it's still a stress to move them from one address to another. So emo emotional fitness and having guidance and support from their caregivers is really important. As we learn some of these things about ourselves and each other, all of a sudden we, are, we understand why we, uh, some of our failures. Oh, sorry. Can you uh, back that up? Okay. So... Um, the biggest thing that we think about is how, how do we uh, process the observations that are coming from Dr. Justin's data, or how do we process the observation of our caregivers? How do we, how do we know it's true? How do we know how to interpret information that comes into all of our huge, I spend hours and hours at feedlots looking through numbers. Uh, I get there early in the morning. It takes me three hours to, to summarize what has happened since I've been there the last time. But the point is, we want to understand what the numbers say. The thing that has been so important to me that I didn't realize is that what Bud and Chris taught us from, from Australia is that animals are the biggest liars in, in the kingdom unless they trust us. And that's so data that is not true is worse than no data. And that's, that's what I kind of want to make a point of. Uh, in order for us to get animals to trust us, we have greeters at our feedlot. When animals come there, somebody's there to welcome them. We, we used to let them wander down to their home pen. The Australians and the Brazilians have taught us that you lead animals. Never let animals go unattended. You, you try to encourage people to be a shepherd, not a cowboy. Really, really is an important thing. But once people get to feel this communication between themselves and the animals, that encourages health, status, honesty. These animals are so, so uh, uh, willing to share with you if they trust you. I had no idea. And when you have animals that are content, the immune function goes out the window. 
We, uh, I, I think that's what's the, the frontier that we have now is what we're learning from, from some of the behavioral research, the, all of the hormonal, the immune, immunology, all the DNA technology is really important. This is a really important picture because this, these two photos are of the same calf taken 30 seconds apart. The photo on the right was taken out of my pickup window. That calf didn't think I would get out of the pickup. His left ear's down. He's salivating. His eyes won't. He's breathing with difficulty. He's ill. But the picture on the left, once I got out of my pickup incorrectly and crawled up on the bunk and he didn't trust me, he lied to me. And so if a pin rider sees the calf on the right, he will take him to the hospital. If he sees the one on the left, he'll leave him. And leaving a sick calf in a pen 12 hours is a disaster. So I, understanding these things so we can interpret the data, uh, it, it's just, it's just really important. Uh, my best example of this, uh, instinct was my wife and I bought a, a couple loads of calves from here on South Dakota a couple years ago and they, they went through the sale barns in Huron and that, and they loaded those cattle and they sent them down to where I live. And they were, the trucks were stranded in a blizzard. And so the trucks were eight to 12 hours late. When we, when we unloaded the first load in the dark, the, the truck backed up and the cattle were fine. When they backed up the second truck, you could see a lot of blood hemorrhage on the side of that trailer. And you could see that a little calf had gotten so tired that he'd stuck his foot out that oval air, air vent and he'd amputated his toe. I, I dug around in the snow on the side of that truck and there was a little frozen toe there. The truck driver felt terrible about that. And he said, I will, uh, uh, let's get a photo of the lame animal so that I can talk to our insurance people. Maybe they'll adjust the freight on you. This is going to be a disaster. And so I said, sure. We thought it would take just a moment to find the lame animal. There was not a single lame animal in that truckload. We went around the pen three times. The only way we identified that heifer is that she was the one leaving a bloody track in the snow. We sorted her off, took a photo of that, pit, of that foot, bandaged it, put, him, put her into shelter uh, with a friend of hers. What was she doing with the foot the next day? Like this. The point is, that animal was so sure that I was a wolf that it was willing to hide the loss of a toe. So if that instinct is strong enough to, to hide the loss of a, of a part of a foot, it's no mystery they would hide a little bit of early IBR in the sinuses or a little bit of lung score one pneumonia in a lung. So it's really, really important when we see data, when we think about data, that we, we take for granted or we make sure that it's accurate. Uh, our, our whole, uh, focus on, on prudent antibiotic use is to take care of the ones that deserve the antibiotics correctly. And so the earlier you treat an animal, the better he responds. We have to be able to get these animals to want to go away from their friends and go to the hospital and stand quietly to be evaluated. And they should be treated quietly and walk out of the treatment hospital and go directly to feed and water and bedding. Uh, this is just an example. We used to, we used to have problems getting sick animals out of a, out of a pen. Watch this person go with this animal. These, this is a team of three organisms that can't wait to get to the hospital. Every time this animal stops, watch him go to the front. We used to push on cattle's hips or their ribs to make them go. Every time, and as you watch these two go together, this horse is giving this animal slightly more room. That is continue. Parallel motion stops cattle, but he just keeps moving out an inch at a time further and further away, and that means continue to cattle. These things are, are things that people have learned that has absolutely changed our use of antimicrobials in a hospital. As they go together, the rest of the animals are absolutely unaffected. They're, they're still standing there just, just beautifully. Look at the rhythm in bio and, in nature. That horse's foot cadence is exactly the same as the steer's. It just, uh, if he wants him to go further, he has him take longer steps. But he never speeds up his feet. When this animal stops and asks for guidance, look, that's, 
That's the precious posture. He goes to the front and becomes more available and says, I want you to go to the gate. I'll show you where to go and I'll guide you. And if you want to stop, I'll stop. I'll reward the stop. But having, having people and having uh, an awareness of this kind of activity changes the way you, you look about or you think about physiology and pathology. When he stops at the gate, I mean, be patient. We, we said the attention span of a gerbil is seven seconds. A like steers is about 6.5. He can't stand to stand there longer than seven seconds, and then he'll go. But if you push on him before you count to seven, you have problems. But these are things that we have to become very, very aware of as we, as we go through time. Um, how do you get, there we go. So, I wanna, I wanna just quickly go through whisper as an example of how we learn more about animals. Uh, BRD, bovine respiratory disease, is a complex, uh, respiratory disease in the feedlot industry. Uh, 75% of the morbidity is, is assigned to that. Um, dis despite better antibiotics and more vaccines, we're not making much progress. And, and as we think about it, um, the thing that really upsets me is that there's no correlation between the risk of a lung lesion at harvest and a treatment history. That is, that is, uh, it, it is so sad to me. So sometimes we'll have cattle that have been, have a, a treated population and an untreated population and the lung lesions at harvest will be similar in nature. That tells us we could do better at finding these animals. Here's a research, 40% of the calves treated for BRD showed lung lesions while 42% of those that had not been diagnosed showed the same lesions. What happened? We treated some unnecessarily, and we didn't find other cattle. So we, we can always get better at, at doing, uh, uh, doing diagnostics. Uh, all of these, uh, for, uh, this, and, and Dr. Thompson, 42% of animals had lung lesions of slaughter, while 70% had never been treated for BRD. Those are, those are common research findings that we really should, should understand and do better. Um, recent uh, evidence suggests that non-clinical BRD, uh, can, can be common. The point is we're not doing a very good job of, of identifying the cattle at risk and the ones that we pull we're not being that accurate with either. <clears throat> this stethoscope brings a, a, a new technology that helps us do a thorough physical exam. And we didn't start with an electronic stethoscope. One of the things that I want us to re, be reminded of, most of the research on BRD, most of the research done to clear and label antibiotic use for BRD in animals, has been based on research where undifferentiated fever was part of the case definition. So we've had, we've got piles of research projects where we've studied BRD and most, the most important part of the case definition was undifferentiated fever. I don't know of an antimicrobial that's cleared for treating hot rectums. It's treated, they're cleared to be treated, or, or the antibiotics are cleared to, to treat BRD or pneumonia. And so I think we can do a lot better diagnostically than relying on, on rectal temperature. Dr. Justin said, that slide a minute ago, said there's a full two degrees variation in normal cattle. I had no idea until I started charting this, uh, that, that cattle that are eating normally their rectal temperature varies a full two degrees two or three times a day. When does it go up? After their big meal. And so it depends on when you take that reading. And, and, and so those, those relying on undifferentiated fever to drive the, the, the diagnosis is we, we can do better than that. Um, we, we there, we've taken x-rays, ultrasound is promising, MRIs, are not practical. So uh, what what I used to do, uh, I, 
Um, my, my problem was is that the observations of our hospital people didn't match with the treatment responses because we'd have, there was very, very poor correlation between rectal temperature and case and treatment success. I would, uh, I would lay out my protocols and say, okay, if you take an animal to the hospital and his temperature is 1036 to 104, you use antibiotic A. If it's 104 to 105, antibiotic B. If it's 105 to 107, antibiotic C. And I would have thought if the thermometer was really telling me very much that I'd be able to do reports or uh, look at the correlations between rectal temperature and case fatality rate. And I'll show you some data. It was very, very disappointing. Uh, and, and so I think that the thing is that our method of d disease diagnosis are not adequate for evaluating some management changes uh, or talking about product efficacy. So as we as we got started, we we used mostly this uh, DART syndrome. We we would say now we can't even if he has a high temperature, he has to have depression, lack of appetite. Uh, his he has to breathe with difficulty, have low tolerance to exercise, and then a temperature. But that's and that's a big help. It help, it gives you a guideline to to uh, uh, to to evaluate an animal, but it still doesn't tell you much about his lung function. Um, this these are the kind of cattle that that encourage me to start asking my people to use just hand uh, just hand stethoscopes. A Littman SE2E has made feedlots more money in America than anything in, I can believe. We, because we'd pull. This is an animal that was three days on feed, and I said, why did you take him out of the pen? He said, Dr. Tommy would not eat. He was weak. His, his fetlocks knuckled. Uh, his nose is scabby. He's, he's, he must have pneumonia. And so they would take him out, and, and they would put him in the feed alley, and waiting for other people to come by and take these animals to the hospital, and the minute we took that animal out of his pen and let him have freedom, he'd start eating all the neighbor's feed. What was wrong with this animal? That was a missed acclimation. This animal wouldn't compete at the bunk. This animal was not did not perceive that he belonged in his home pen. This animal ate 10 pounds of corn on the way to the hospital, stopped at a tank and drank water. He didn't he didn't need an antimicrobial he needed somebody that understood him. And I think these things are so, so important. So um, it, it, it really lets us understand. Depression can be very, very complicated. These, uh, a person had checked this pin, and I asked them, can you go back to pin 317 and take these three animals with BRD? I want to take them to the hospital. I want to listen to them. And they, so here they come with these three animals. All of them have abnormal posture. All of them are showing depression, but only one of them has pneumonia. It's really important that we that we don't fall uh, into the trap of just using depression or rectal temperature. Uh, the the Charlet steer um, uh, was was a add-on. Um, the the middle steer uh, was depressed and stretched out. Both he had bilateral toe abscesses in his hind feet. He didn't have pneumonia. The poor old animal in the front is the only one that had pneumonia. It was temperature of 107.2 with lung score 4. So I think um, the, these two animals standing by the pen, uh, Alberto said, Dr. Tom, we, especially that back one, she's been in here three days, she won't eat, she's empty, she's got nasal exudate, she's, we have to take her to the hospital, she has BRD. And I said, if you'll go up and take uh, move some of the cattle away from the bunk, I'll bring her to the bunk and let's see if she wants to eat before we go to the hospital. This, this is, this is what she did when we got to the bunk. She just needed someone to go with her. She, she could have pneumonia, but if you, if you treat her and don't fix this, uh, psychological or emotional fitness situation, the antimicrobial will fail. So it's really important that we look at these areas and this data at a at a broader a, a broader surface. So uh, what what we've done is is taken animals with similar temperatures 
and started doing uh, this. This was a hand auscultation. These these two animals, uh, the red calf has a temperature 106 Fahrenheit. The white one is 105, but they sounded completely different. Completely different. So I I uh, started doing research on these and documenting this. I purchased these two calves. This is the red steer. He needs treated. He needs in the hospital. But his his uh, lung is essentially normal. He has a why would an animal have a fever? It could be purely viral infection. It could be pure uh, loss of gut integrity. It could be it could be a le leaky gut syndrome from some nutritionist figuring out he can't. Yeah, we have to hurry. <laughs> and but it it the point is here's a the, here's a lung that's almost normal. Compared to this, compared to this white animal that has a lower temperature but a lot more severe pathology, I, absolutely amazing. So as we teach people, you they have to know that these two cases do not deserve the same antimicrobial, and and so we've we started with just teaching people to listen with with stethoscopes. Um, this is uh, a, a graph that's hard to see for you. But what it, that's when we were using lung score 1 through 10, but the red line are the lung scores 7 through 9. That's the case fatality rate for those. The very bottom line down there, that's the case fatality rate for the lung score 1s and 2s. So we doc documented that there's a clear, when people listen and they can categorize them, that that is an important tool to prognosticate uh, treatment response and 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 severity of of the disease. Why are cattle easy to listen to? I I'd listen to all these horses. I used to do a lot of equine practice, and I'd listen to these thoroughbreds. I couldn't hear anything. But cattle are easier. Which animal has the highest oxygen requirement per, per kilogram of body weight? I thought the horse did. No, the cow does. Isn't that amazing? Look at look at the the, the a cow needs 255 milli, uh, per kilogram. The horse 127. Isn't that amazing? Why do the cattle need more oxygen? They're the perfect miracle to harvest the the oxygen from photosynthesis to convert cellulose and turn cellulose out where I live now. The the grass is four, five, six percent protein. This enables that beautiful, beautiful animal to take low quality food and turn it into 24% protein milk or 42% protein beef. It's a, it's a true miracle, but it requires a lot of oxygen. So if a cow needs more oxygen compared to a horse, which one has the largest lung field? The horse. I mean, the creator made this animal that could do this magic thing with uh, needing oxygen but he shorted them on lung space. I suppose that's why we ride horses to chase cows. But at, at anyway, so if you have an animal that needs lots of oxygen and has a little lung field, which one would have the highest flow rate? The cow. So the flow rate in cattle is 8.7, almost eight times the rate of a horse. So when you listen to a horse, it's very quiet. When you listen to a, to a healthy animal, a cow, it just sounds like a rock concert in there. You can hear stuff. Really, really important. So as we converted from this hand auscultation, we developed this electronic computer system that is called Whisper. You, you, you listen to the animal for eight seconds, push a button, and in, in about four seconds, it, it, it assigns a lung score. And at the same time, it sends every one of these auscultated sounds to the cloud so that as we watch treatment response and watch pathology, these lung scores are, the, the logarithm that assigns a lung score is t t t remodeled just a little bit based on treatment response. So it's, it's uh, we listen to the right apical lobe. We, we, uh, this is just an example of the histopathology in a lung score one. Uh, the audiogram is at the bottom, but you can see that histopo histopathology all of those alveolar walls you can see are one cell thick. 
It's, it's almost an absolute normal lung. We're at the point now where because we'll have animals that have some uh, indigestion, we'll have some cattle that, that show abnormal uh, uh, fevers from virus infections. At most feedlots now, all of our lung score one cattle that look like they have BRD are treated essentially with water, grass hay, and a big thick bed. They get no antimicrobials. And none of those animals suffer. It is amazing. So we've been able to reduce our BRD antimicrobial use at some feed yards, depending on the crew, by, by 30 to 40 percent. Never treat them. Never treat them. As we get, as we get to lung, oops, sorry. As we get to lung score three, you can see the audiogram changes, but the outside of that lung still looks about the same. The histopathology is real deep, but that, or, yeah, it's, it's in the center of the, of the lung, and, but the histopath, you can already see the infiltration of the white blood cells. You can still see that. Two minutes, all right. Okay. And this is, this is a lung score four with, with the bronchioles full of that thing. So I think, I think what we wanna, we wanna review is that, is that the, this is just case fatality rate versed on temperature. Uh, you can see the correlation of using the rectal thermometer as the guideline. There's a 6% correlation. When we use the stethoscope, it goes up to 79%. So it, it changes your, your, your predictability. It changes your accuracy. At our feedlots now, if we, if we, uh, auscultate cattle to decide to treat them, uh, we've reduced our case fatality rate almost, uh, from 13% to 8%. The stethoscope doesn't heal the cattle. It's if we know their lung score four and five, they don't go back home. They go to intensive care. They go to a special place where they're, they're really nurtured. So, and, and when you have those more severe pulls, you don't go home. You go back to that home pen and address that pen more aggressively. So I, I think, I, I think what I'd like to, to just end up is this is, this is a huge review, um, of 15,000 BRD treatments. Uh, the case fatality rate was 8%. So we had uh, uh, 1,300 fatalities, and there were um, there were 608 of these fatalities that had no fever. There were only 210 that had a, l a lung score that was normal. So the point is, use both the stethoscope and the thermometer together. When we used the thermometer, we were 57% accurate. We used the stethoscope, we were 85% accurate, but when we used them both, we were able to predict correctly 93% of the cases. And so I want us to always think about understanding these animals at a, at a higher level. And so as we, as we look uh, uh, through uh, our ability to send this data to the cloud, and then every morning, each of my feedlots will send me uh, this distribution of what the lung score activity was in the hospital yesterday. So not only can we keep refining the logarithm, but I can keep in constant contact with my hospital every morning. So if, uh, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Lucas, and, and we can have some discussion. Um.